Good enough. Really, I'm amazed that you all showed up. It is so nice outside today. I, I thought that it would just be Ernie and me. So I really appreciate you coming and uh, joining us today. If this goes well, I'm going to credit Todd Herman. I read his instructions on how to do uh, a, uh, a uh, Zoom type tour of the layout. And if it doesn't go well, I'm going to blame Todd Herman. So. We'll get started here with the center of Chessie's passenger world. <coughs> Chesapeake in Ohio had a tremendous passenger business that went into two places. One was White Sulphur Springs, uh, West Virginia at the Greenbrier Hotel. And the other place was up the Hot Springs branch from Covington to Hot Springs, Virginia at the Homestead. Now, the CNO didn't really have much of a passenger business when you would compare it to railroads, certainly like the, the Pennsylvania, the New York Central, or the Santa Fe railroads like that. But what they did have was a class operation, and a lot of it centered around bringing trade into these two places. That's pretty much what the Greenbrier and the Homestead look like today. The Homestead looks a lot like it did in 1925 when they built that tour, uh, that tower that's there. And they, uh, the rest of the place is pretty much what it looked like in the late 1890s. The, the, the homestead, I'm sorry, the, the, the Greenbrier, that building is newer, that was built. Actually, I'm not too sure when that particular building came up, but I'm gonna say between 1912 and 1930, certainly by 1932 it was up and operating pretty much as you see it in that picture there. So why these two establishments that go back actually quite a long time into the, uh, the colonial era actually? Well, one of the things that Virginia has and was particularly appealing back in that era were the mineral springs, hot or otherwise. The closest one to us would be up here uh, near Warrington at Falkir Springs. The Hot Springs, Virginia Hot Springs, if you will, is located just to the west of Stanton and up from Covington down here. And the, uh, home, or rather the uh, Greenbrier is located on the CNO's main line. All those circles are attractions, if you would back before Virginia was Virginia and West Virginia. If you take a look at the painting on the left, that's from the album of Virginia, which came out in 1858 by a German artist by the name of Edward Beyer. White Sulphur Springs, the old white was established in 1788. If you were to go there today and you were to look at the central building that exists today, it looks an awful lot like that building. And then you see these cottages that are around the property. Those cottages still exist. If we go over here to Hot Springs, that was established in 1766. It doesn't look anything like that picture does today because they had a fire and, and rebuilt the place in the late 1890s. There's the old white. You can see that it appears very much like what you saw in the album of Virginia, but the homestead has been rebuilt relatively new in this, in this sketch here. I'm not too sure if it's really a photograph, but it looks like that today, with the exception that there's no tower in the central part of this upper section here. But down here to the right, the, uh, that's the swimming pool, the spa, that's all there. This section here on the right-hand side, I've stayed in that section many times. Uh, so, it's, it's a real piece of history when you go down there. As we get to the era that I'm modeling, that's the Greenbrier out front in 1948. The homestead, now the tower has been constructed in the mid 1920s. And again, that's what we're looking at in the 1950s. It was in a desirable location, both of these places. They really promoted the idea of the weather and how pleasant it was throughout the year. There were a lot of things to do. There was uh, tennis. There was, of course, golf. You could take the cure, whatever that really was. You could take the, the tour, the cure. And then, of course, there was the food. There was the socializing. 
uh, as, a, as a young boy, I remember going with my parents to the homestead. Uh, uh, my parents would go over for the Rotary Convention every spring. One of the things that I really enjoyed was sitting out in the main hall there for tea while musicians, live musicians perform, not a DJ, not a serious XM transmission coming through a bunch of speakers, but real musicians. Give you a sense of where it's located. Those two circles there, that's Virginia Hot Springs, the homestead up there in that circle to the right, to the left out on the main line of the CNO is White Sulphur Springs where the Greenbrier is. Now they were capitalizing particularly in the 20th century on the trade that was coming down from New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, even north of there. From the west, you had a lot of trade that was coming in from Chicago, Detroit, Cincinnati, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Ashland. And all of this was not individuals so much as it was conventions and private cars that were coming into White Sulphur Springs and the homestead. Getting there though, prior to the latter part of the 19th century was a bit of a challenge. You might be able to take canals once they got going. There was the James River Canal Canal that went up the James River to Lynchburg. And so that might be a possibility, but you're gonna end up in a stagecoach at some point, even after the railroads uh, got past Clifton Forge, which was Williamson back in the uh, uh, Civil War era. Once the railroad got past there, there still was a chance that you were gonna be taking a stagecoach uh, to some of these other locations. The left side, that's White Sulphur Springs Station as it looked in uh, the early uh, 1800s on the right, that's what uh, Hot Springs, the station looked like then. Uh, the CNO bought the Greenbrier or the old white, it was known up to uh, 1910, and they reopened it in 1912 as the Greenbrier. 1971, the last CNO train came to White Sulphur Springs. The last Pullman special was a General Motors special. We'll talk about that a little bit in just in a moment. Uh, and then Amtrak. The, uh, the last train, well, the Hot Springs branch was put into operation in 1891. It was not owned by the, or the branch of course was owned by the CNO, but the hotel was not owned by the CNO. Melvin Ingalls owned the hotel and he had been a president of the CNO. So of course, with his connections, he was able to get a branch built up to serve the hotel. And both of these were served by the CNO up through 1971. Before we talk about White Sulphur Springs, we're going to take a little bit of a detour to Hot Springs and see what's up there. And the reason I'm going to make this detour is that it's not modeled on my layout. I would like to model it, and I had intended to, that it would be part of the layout. But at this point, that's got to be future world. You can see. Uh, Again, the CNO's main line coming through here, the, the, the southern part of the main line, that's the James River uh, subdivision. The, the, the top part, the northern part, that's the mountain subdivision, and that turns into the Allegheny subdivision, which is what I'm modeling. To go up to Hot Springs, you would leave Clifton Forge, take the branch off of the main at Covington. When you got up to Hot Springs, it had a track layout that was pretty much like this. Not pretty much, it was like this, taken from the valuation map of 1918. And the track arrangements that you see right here, including the turntable, all of that existed all the way up into the, uh, uh, I think it was 1975 when they finally took up the branch, but the buildings were there up until recent years. They kept that turntable up to the end Past the steam era, they were still turning the Jeeps that they would have bring the train up the branch. They still turn that to, to go back down the branch. That's what the station looked like. The picture on the left, I believe, is 1963. The picture on the right is 1958. You can see that not, not a lot changed uh, between those uh, two times. And actually not a lot changed between those photographs and the end of service in 1971. And then up into recent years, you could still very clearly see where all this was. They would bring up 
not just CNO cars, but they were always bringing up a Pennsylvania car. There was a Pennsylvania car that came down from New York every day or overnight rather, and uh, would be put into a mixed train to be taken up to the hotel. And uh, it could be just these few cars that you see here. It might be just two cars. It might be a whole bunch of cars. There might even be a second section that could come up here. And if you'll notice down here on the right-hand picture in the lower left-hand corner, that yellow electric box, they could put these cars on standby power. Turntable, looking back to the hotel, there's the tower up there. And then on the right-hand side, they're still fueling the steam plant with coal. Mixed train on the right-hand side, bringing coal up there. It might be boxcars bringing up supplies. But there was always a caboose, and there was usually some sort of freight cars attached to the train. On the left-hand side, uh, they did not have freight cars in that particular view. This would all be in the mid-60s. These pictures were taken. In the 1950s, though, they had not received the Jeeps. The Jeeps didn't come to the Allegheny subdivision until uh, probably about 1955 or so. And, and the Jeeps were what really ended steam on the Allegheny subdivision. But you could have a Mali coming up, bringing a train. That is a modern Pullman car that's on the rear of the train. The second car, the Combine, that car still exists. It was built in 1911, I built. And if you wanted to see it, you could go down to Clifton Forge and we have it on display with the Chesapeake and Ohio Historical Society. The consolidation on the right, number 701, that's uh, out on the main line on its way to go up the branch to pick up Pullman cars. And that engine for about 20 years served the branch. So early 1950s, there would be no diesel power to go up to Hot Springs. This is a typical group of cars that you would see going up there. You can see all the way to the left, just barely, there's a caboose, a box car. The combine now has been painted into the tricolor scheme, the yellow, blue, and gray scheme. And then you've got these two over here on the right side, two Pensy cars. Uh, these Glen series cars from the Pennsylvania Railroad were regular callers to both Hot Springs and White Sulphur Springs. The mainline passenger trains in 1950 consisted of the George Washington, which was inaugurated on the 200th anniversary of Washington's birth, 1932. Uh, it lasted, it was the long, uh, not the longest lasting train, but it's probably the most memorable of the three name trains that the CNO had. The CNO made a big deal out of George Washington. They said this was George Washington's railroad. And they actually had a tenuous, but nonetheless, they did have a rationale that you sort of made sense, especially from the advertising point of view, that they could make that claim. Among the things that George Washington surveyed was the James River and Canal Canal from Richmond up to Lynchburg. I guess it got up to uh, Buchanan, uh, Virginia, just past the mountains there. And he was the honorary president of the ca canal, first honorary president. So he surveyed it, he was honorary president. The Richmond and Allegheny Railroad uh, was built on the towpath that he surveyed and the CNO bought the Richmond and Allegheny in the 1890s. And so that's how they made the claim and did a lot of promotion on the railroad, calling it George Washington's Railroad. That's the George Washington coming out of Washington on the right-hand side. <clears throat> the sportsman is the diesel at White Sulphur Springs there on the left-hand side. That was inaugurated in 1930. And the idea behind the sportsman was to connect the upper peninsula of Michigan with the seashore of Virginia and all points in between that offered anything from hunting to swimming to skiing. Uh, they had specials, lots of specials came into White Sulphur Springs, bringing in uh, lots of conventions. So that would be an example on the right-hand side with that Jeep. Uh, there were two locals, number 13, Charlottesville to Huntington in the opposite direction, number 104. Probably the, not probably, the best train to serve both the Homestead 
and the Greenbrier was the FFV, the Fast Flying Virginia. And it was inaugurated in 1889, ran to 1968, and it was the longest lasting of all the name trains that the CNO had. The name George Washington did continue for a period of time under Amtrak. Taking a look here at the 1876 schedule, Again, the railroad got to White Sulphur Springs about 1973, I'm sorry, 1973, uh, 1873. They're really promoting, as you can see on the left-hand side of the schedule, those different mineral springs. But they still were promoting, or already promoting, the idea of coming down from New York, Philadelphia, so forth. Now, how would you get there? Because uh, you couldn't come in from uh, Old Point Comfort down by uh, Virginia Beach, down by Newport News and Norfolk. You would have to come by boat all the way up to Richmond. And that boat could come out of Baltimore, could come out of, uh, it could come out of New York. So that was a possible route to go. That sounds like that would be a lot of fun. And of course, you could take the train to get there even in 1876. 1889, we said that the FFV was inaugurated, and that was a big deal because now we have vestibule cars, we have electric lighting, and we have a dining car. So very posh way to travel, but you still can get there by boat. But by 1889, you could travel all the way from Norfolk to White Sulphur Springs or Hot Springs on the train. So no longer would you go to Richmond. So I settled on 1950 as the year that I'm modeling. And I thought we would take a look at the schedule in 1950 and talk about uh, and begin to develop how the operational plan would work. If you look at on the left-hand side, the FFV, and you see that you could get on the FFV at 635 where you would depart from Penn Station in New York on six, at 6.35 p.m. So you finished your day of business and you're, you and your family are gonna go down to either the Homestead or the Greenbrier. And so your hotel room for the night is on the train, on a Pullman. You arrive at 5.55 in the morning. Now that on the surface sounds like not such a great time to be arriving at the hotel but you got to sleep in to eight or 8.30. On the flip side, go over to the FFV on the right-hand side, you would leave at nine o'clock, spend the night on the train again, arrive at Penn Station at 9.15 in the morning. And I, I'm not too sure at that point if you would be occupying the car, I kind of doubt it. Uh, I haven't seen any information that really says one way or another. Now, the sportsman was also suited for getting people to and from the West. So if we look at the sportsman on the left-hand side of the schedule coming down from New York, uh, it wasn't so much that coming down from New York was a great option on the sportsman, but the departure going to the West was a good option. So you would get on the train at six o'clock at White Sulphur Springs and continue on West to Ashland, Chicago, St. Louis, wherever it was that you were going to be going. Coming into White Sulphur on the Sportsman, once again, it was very much like coming in on the FFE. It arrives early, but you were able to occupy your car until 8 or 8.30, uh, depending on just what year the uh, schedule was. And then the limousine would come down from the hotel and pick you up along with uh, the rest of the folks who were traveling with you. And, go through that uh, beautiful gate there and head on up to the hotel. So as I said, the part of the railroad that I'm modeling is the Allegheny subdivision. And that's shown here inside this oval. And I have a staging area that comes off the main line at Rons just before Ronsford, which is the Greenbrier subdivision that would go up to Cass uh, it goes up to, to Durban. So that should give you a sense of the lay of the land here relative to New York, Chicago, 
Newport News, so forth and so on. So it's about a 95 mile stretch of the railroad. It was a double track railroad, not a lot of local business on there. This is schematically how it looks like uh, on my layout. Uh, the left hand side, you can, you can see that for what it is. Uh, the, the shape of the layout, if you will, is fundamentally what you see there on the right hand side. The Clifton Ford staging area is out in what I call the ping pong room. Uh, it goes through a utility space and then comes out into a peninsula in the train room at a place called Jerry's Run, goes through a couple tunnels and comes out here at Allegheny, which is where a lot of action is relative to both coal traffic as well as passenger traffic. Back through the utility space, back out on the outside wall, a straight run, which is very much in keeping with the layout of the real location, just uh, luck of the draw as I was putting this together. At Whitcomb jun Junction, you uh, go into staging and I can have a train either come or two trains come out of there, uh, a passenger or a freight, one train each way, uh, each day. You come to Ronsert, which was the division point for uh, the Greenbrier branch. Uh, Underneath Snowflake Quarry, underneath the stairs and into Hinton, Snowflake is one of the few places on the railroad that I actually have uh, anything other than it being perfectly flat. And I, I credit both Hinton and Snowflake uh, to uh, Matt Thompson being over on different occasions and saying, could you do, and it was just a concept and those two general concepts that he came with uh, came up with really made a, a huge difference in uh, how the layout is coming together. Go through Hinton, which is kind of its own staging yard. Hinton is where they would change water level engines to uh, mountain climbing engines. And then the west staging is on the other side of this area here, which is a shop. So that's the overall design. The basic information that I used to create the design came from valuation maps and other documents. The valuation maps were created in 1918 as a way to document everything that was on the railroad, everything from buildings, including privies, all the way up to stations, location of track, tracks that were put in service, taken out of service, where the property was purchased, or who the railroad sold the property to. A lot of information can be found on these valuation maps, including subs subsequent reproductions of the map when they did make changes. And each one of those changes was noted in a block like you see up in the right-hand side. Uh, this is a drawing that was created based on that map to show the water supply facilities at White Sulphur Springs. We're gonna come back and talk about this a little bit more, why it was laid out as it is. Just real quick tour. There's the freight house and the freight yard on the right-hand side over here. The set off tracks or the park tracks are over here. These two tracks right here, plus this one over here called the uh, president's track. And then there were side track records that, uh, let me just go back one slide. Sidetrack Records was just more of an informal catalog of all the tracks. You can see the length of the tracks and the remarks. It might indicate the purpose of the track or if it was a private track or if it was actually owned by somebody other than the railroad. So you can get the, the basic shape of the layout. And then I created a schematic of the layout. And the red is to indicate the passenger tracks, exclusive use for passenger trains. The uh, freight operation going on the gray ones could not come on to the, uh, the red area. Those have to be kept open for, for the passenger car. So all of your switching down here at the freight station would have to be done within the confines of the gray tracks. The team track in reality would have been three tracks. The three tracks in front of the freight station uh, I, I'm really glad that I blindly followed the plan rather than just selectively compressed and took out one of those tracks. It turns out that all three tracks are necessary for the uh, switching of this area. Then you come back up to the steam plant. That steam plant was just for passenger cars. It was not for the hotel, but the coal trestle supplied coal for the, the uh, hotel as well as for the steam plant. 
In addition to that, there was a uh, uh, electric building so that they could provide electricity for the cars that were parked on the tracks. You got uh, the main line eastbound, westbound, and there's an eastbound siding. Uh, the crossovers are very important, uh, as one of my friends from the Sino Historical Society, Jesse Smith, would say. Uh, he says the and Jesse was an engineer for the for the CNO and then for C, CSX. He says those crossovers are there for a reason. So be sure that you're putting them in. This is what it looked like from the air. You can see starting down here in the right hand side, you got the freight house, freight yard, the three team tracks, the three uh, tracks in front of the uh, freight station I mentioned. There used to be prior to this photo the cattle pen that sat right in here. I've included the cattle pen, although by the time I'm modeling 1950, the, the cattle pen was probably there, but it was no longer in service. Come back up the freight yard lead and you can see the coal trestle. That's the boiler house. And then past the boiler house is transformer <laughs> uh, station, of course, hotel in the upper right hand corner. The track that runs behind the station very important to the operation. That's called the house track. Come down, follow the house track to this siding here where the two passenger cars are. That's the pocket track. That is also a very important part of this operation. This is what it looks like down on the basement. Uh, took this a couple of years ago. That's Jeff Mutter and Bob Sprague. Uh, and they're bringing a passenger train uh, on the pocket track and on into the house track behind the station. Uh, you can see the coal trestle here on the right-hand side. There's the freight yard lead. It actually goes down just as it did at White Sulphur Springs. So that's the other piece of uh, elevation that I have on the railroad. The two park tracks that I have, I really didn't have room to, uh, to put in the, uh, 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 the president's track, which was another park track. The Greenbrier subdivision, the Durban station, comes up here behind the railroad. And this is, uh, you'll see when we go downstairs, that this is a view block now as I'm building a mountain and a river. And then the Greenbrier subdivision continues over, that's Pete LaGuardia, uh, to Ronsford there. Before we talk about the passenger stuff, let's, let's just take a quick run down to the freight station. Again, in the 1950s, we would be having uh, steam, a very prominent part of the railroad. I forgot now just when the freight station was built, but I'm going to peg it at 1910 just to give us a rough idea when that uh, was built. And then it came down uh, probably, I, I, again, I don't remember, I think it was 1980s when that uh, building came down. I was using the old Ravel freight station as a stand-in which was, uh, and now I've, with, with the silhouette, I've, I've cut out a building that more or less is uh, what the real deal is. We'll see that when we go downstairs. That picture was taken in the early 1970s. So it, you, no telling what you might find at White Sulphur Springs. Passenger station was built in 1932. I said it was George Washington's railroad. In 1930s, when they were rebuilding in the middle of the depression, the CNO was financially very well off and they took that opportunity of uh, depressed prices and having a lot of cash in the treasury to do a lot of stuff to upgrade the railroad. They rebuilt the main line in places and they built new stations, built new signal towers, which were called cabins on the CNO and they put it all in a Georgian architectural style, again, to reflect, if you will, that it's George Washington's railroad. That's what the backside of the station looks like. That house track I was talking about is this upper track, the main line, of course, up there by the train shed. And then the track that's closest to us, that's the freight yard lead. Another view of it. The track going off to the left, that's going to take you down to the freight house or where that engine is uh, switching passenger cars over there. Uh, that's, that's the house track. Another view of 
the station. I'll point out up here in near the end of the train shed, it's actually beyond the end of the train shed, that's the ice house. And they use that ice for air conditioning where it was ice activated. They also had ice available out of that for say private cars that of course would have a kitchen on board, a galley on board. So talking about the passenger trains, I, using the FFV as the example here, the uh, taking from the passenger train concepts book, these, these trains are both the FFV. The number 43 is the train that comes up from Newport News to Charlottesville. And then the train is combined with the train that's coming down from Washington with cars that have come down from New York to combine into number three. Now, prior to 1950, uh, and prior to uh, the World War II, but up, up into the late 40s, these trains were running in multiple sections on a regular basis. There was that much business. If you look at number 137, uh, that New York car is going over to Cincinnati, but the three cars at the bottom are coming from New York. One's going to Cincinnati, uh, uh, right, one's going to Cincinnati, uh, one's going to White Sulphur Springs, and one's going to Hot Springs. That's what happened every day. But that's not all that happened. This first letter right here describes what you just saw. It just simply says that Pennsylvania train 151 and CNO train number three on April 28th, this is 1952, we'll have an extra New York White Sulphur Springs overflow sleeper. So in addition to the two cars that are regular, here's one more. So, and it tells you the, uh, the conductor, the train crew, how they're to handle that car. Just put it right behind the White Sulphur sleeper, regular sleeper. Go to uh, April 22nd, back to April 22nd, and it's a little bit more complicated here. 151 CNO3, now they're gonna have three extra sleepers coming down from New York. And this is for the American Institute of Accountants. And we talked about the occupancy until 8 a.m., right? Handle of adjoining regular New York White Sulphur Sleeper for Washington. Then also PR 151, CNO 303, 303 is the train that goes up to Hot Springs. We'll have an extra New York hot springs overflow sleeper. So there's an extra car there. So that's what, four extra cars that are coming down from New York on this train. But it gets even more complicated. So uh, you can see that there are a whole bunch of cars that are coming down from New York. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, that had come, I should had come down from New York or going back and then in addition to those eight cars, CNO business car number 28 officially occupied from White Sulphur to New York. And then the regular New York sleeper car, C67, will be left at White Sulphur Springs Sunday morning to be switched into this train. Uh, CNO 28, the business car will be at White Sulphur to be switched into the train. So now we have a much more complicated scenario occurring right here than what would be the regular uh, form of operation. And I've got letters like this that go on for two pages describing the trains that were coming in. And some are multiple letters in order to describe all of the special move for just one organization. In 1972, they brought in, now that I wanna tell you the number of cars, I forgot it, how many it was, but they brought in roughly a thousand people all on sleeping cars, all, uh, I shouldn't say private cars, but all sleeping cars. There was another documentation. These were on flimsies. The other ones were on just regular paper. So I'm not quite sure how these were set. If they were telegraphed and typed out or they were through the uh, company uh, mail, uh, but these were on flimsy to suggest that it might've come on a telegraph. This is really cool because this not only tells you what cars are, how many cars are going, but look, Imperial Ridge is one of the cars. Memory Brook is one of the cars. Uh, I've forgotten which railroads, if that's New York Central or Pennsylvania, those of you who know those railroads would probably know. That's not the point. They came from another railroad. 
Allegheny Club, Clifton Forge, and Alexandria, those are all uh, CNO cars. From that information, which was about 10 years worth of these letters, uh, a very incomplete 10 year uh, compilation, but nonetheless, 10 years worth from about 1950 to 1960, I was able to tabulate the names of the cars and the railroads and the type of the cars and what days they were at White Sulphur Springs. So I got four pages of this stuff right here. And it's really interesting to find out that name the railroad and you can have that car come in to White Sulphur Springs. One of my favorite letters is the San Francisco Knights of Columbus coming in on the Southern Pacific car to White Sulphur Springs. Taking a little bit of a ground look at the way it was set up there, President's Track is just a park track, not necessarily for the exclusive use of the president. Two park tracks, set off tracks there, the way down to the freight house, and then the house track there on the right-hand side. That's the house track that the Jeep is on, track down to the freight yard. And then one of the park tracks, that's the lead to the park tracks there in the front. This is the pocket track these four cars are on. House track runs behind the station. You can see the, the steam, the boiler house right over here, a couple hopper cars. President's track is back there. This is that part of the 1972 move. And just look at the rainbow of colors representing all sorts of railroads. It's a very cool series of uh, pictures. These were taken by Tom Dixon. That was 1972. You, again, you might, you just never know what you're gonna find. Nickel Plate Road office car there behind the station. Chicago Northwestern sitting on the president's track. Southern sitting on the president's track. So the passenger operations, how did all this work? Well, the key to it, of course, was the operator at WS Cabin. Originally, WS Cabin was located at the station, and then in the early part of the 20th century, or I should say latter part of the 18th, 19th century, they, they relocated the cabin to about a mile west. The traffic, we'll talk about this in just a moment, the traffic was getting so heavy that they were thinking about how they might rebuild the passenger facilities at White Sulphur Springs. And they were thinking about moving WS Cabin back into the station. But WS Cabin would receive information from the dispatcher in Hinton to saying, this, this is what's coming at you. And he would be prepared to line up the, uh, the switches for the uh, train to do its thing. So going back to that water supply map, and looking at the highlighted area, this is how it worked. If you came in to White Sulphur Springs and you were the first train to arrive, you had to go and leave your cars on the house track. And the reason for that is if you left your cars on the house track, the next batch of cars that were to be left, the engine could get in and could get out without having to do a switching move. That is to get into the pocket track, say come in from the right-hand side onto the pocket track, cars are over here on the house track, and then come back out onto the main line. But if there were cars on the pocket track and you were the next train to come in, the only way that you could put the cars onto the house track would to be do a switching move. You'd have to run around the train or if you uh, were, uh, it, oriented so that you didn't have to do a, a, a run around, you would have to do a switching move, which meant that the crew got paid twice. And the railroad designed these two tracks so that they would not have to pay the crews twice for a switching move. If you were the first train coming down from New York, say, and you're coming from right to left, you were the first train, you would come onto the pocket track travel onto the house track and all of the cars that are going to be left for those people to stay in them until eight in the morning would be on the end 
All you had to do was uncouple them and move on. There was no switching. Conversely, the train coming from the west, from left to right, would pull onto the pocket track, pull past the switch, and drop the cars that are on the rear of that train. And again, it was not a switching move. Now, it did get a little bit more complicated than that because you got cars sitting there. What happens next? There were any number of things that could happen. The cars could all be taken back to Clifton Forge, 35 miles, to be cleaned. They could be taken to Hinton, same thing. So the local train, local passenger train might stop, pick up the cars and take them whatever direction they need to go. That's another possibility. Another possibility is another train's coming in with a bunch of cars and they need to get these cars off of these two tracks and onto the park tracks. So one of the freight engines that's coming by would uh, stop and cut off its train and do the passenger switching. Or more often than not, those helper engines, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that went up to Allegheny just five miles to the east, those helper engines would cut off the train at Allegheny and return to Hinton Light. They could stop here at White Sulphur and do any switching that needed to be done which had to be really cool to watch a 2666. Did I get the right number of numbers there? One of those H8 Alleghenies switching these uh, pipsqueak passenger cars by comparison to the Colos they were running over the mountain. So there were a lot of possibilities and a lot of scenarios that could occur here as a result of having uh, the park tracks, the pocket track and the house track. In 1940, they were thinking, we've got an awful lot of business that is occurring here. And we need to rethink how this thing is laid out. So the problems they were trying to overcome was engines arriving from the east and then being returned to Clifton Forge. They would back up six miles to Allegheny so they could be turned and run the proper direction, the balance of 29 miles back to, to Clifton Forge. Engines arriving from the east, coming from Clifton Forge to pick up eastbound specials, going back to Clifton Forge. They turned at Allegheny and then backed the six miles to White Sulphur and then coupled under the train and then would return east again. Engines arriving from the west, from Hinton, to pick up westbound specials, they were backed up 17 miles from Ronsford, where they turned the engines there. Trains needing to go to Clifton Ford for service or layover travel 35 miles each direction. Private and office cars needing to be turned were turned at Allegheny. The engine had to back in one of those directions and the car had to be pushed in one of those directions. Well, railroad didn't like that, but as a modeler, this is fabulous. In 1940, again, that's, that study, they, they said 19 special trips from White Sulphur to Allegheny to turn office or private cars. There were 70 club cars and observations cars taken 35 miles to Clifton Forge for turning and returned to White Sulphur. 96 engines out of Clifton Forge back to Allegheny to turn and then continue to Clifton Forge. 31 engines out of Clifton Forge with specials were back to Allegheny to turn back to White Sulphur. 13 special trains from the west and return at Hinton were back 17 miles from White Sulphur Springs to Ronsford where the engines were turned. Seven local freights cut off their train at White Sulphur to pick up private and office cars. 12 passenger trains, those are locals 13 and 104 we mentioned earlier, they had to cut off at White Sulphur to take office cars from the resort to Allegheny to be turned. The report also identified the engines that had been used that year. They were J2 Mountains, F15 Pacifics, K2 Mikados, and G9 Consol Consolidations. The only reason I, I think that the Alleghenies, the HHs were not on that list is they were a brand lo new locomotive at that point. That was 248 special moves in one year, all related to the passion operations at White Sulphur Springs. 
So the solution they came up with was to put in a Y track and to expand the park tracks. If you look at the, well, there's the freight depot over there. Nothing's changed there. But if you look over here at the park tracks, the idea was that they would take out the president's track on the left here and add two more park tracks in addition to the ones that already existed. That was the general idea there. Then they would have uh, a Y. There was a, a bit of a, a valley here where there was the creek so they could easily build up that, that creek for the Y track. They started counting up how much this was gonna cost to do all this. In addition to all the signaling that was gonna have to be redone, uh, putting in WS cabin, putting that in the station rather than there. So there was a whole lot of expense that uh, was associated with this that in the final analysis was not worth doing. So they pretty much kept the arrangement that we just discussed as you see right here. That's pretty much what White Sulphur Springs looked like from the late 1940s, actually from the 1930s, all the way up to the Amtrak era. This little diagram would explain how many cars, 31 cars could be parked here. It shows all the electrical hookups, all the steam hookups. So uh, you, you, again, you can draw a, a good idea as to just how they were able to handle all of that equipment there at one time. Looking at my layout here, this is the general arrangement that you saw in the other picture. Uh, Bob and Jeff are bringing in, uh, it probably is the FFV to uh, drop uh, this Pensy car and there's a Canadian Pacific car on this train uh, behind the station on the house track. To orient you a little bit more to the layout, freight yard that we were talking about, that's, that's on uh, the east end of the White Soul Springs area, passenger yard on the left-hand side here. Uh, and then go across to Allegheny and there's the turntable. That's a Walther's turntable. And it's uh, fundamentally, it's exactly the same turntable as what was at Allegheny. And we know that because the Allegheny turntable is exactly the same turntable that's at Clifton Forge. And the CNO Historical Society owns the turntable if anybody's interested in buying one. I'm not gonna go through all the engines, just real quick here. The engines that you would have seen in 1950, as far as diesel power is concerned, pretty much limited to E8s at that point, brand new. H8s, uh, you'd see those. A Lot of Greenbriars, that was the main passenger power prior to the E8s. The Kanaws, another passenger or freight power, very versatile engine on the CNO. The uh, uh, consolidations, of course, and the mountains. So those would be the type of uh, engines that you would uh, you would find on the CNO. So at, at this point, what we're going to do is, uh, in a moment, I'm going to go down to the basement. And um, let me see, how do I stop sharing my screen? I think it's like that. Uh, but I thought if, if you all have some questions that uh, I can make up some answers to, I would uh, be happy to entertain those. And, uh, and then, then we'll go downstairs and take a look and we can also handle a few more questions if that's something you all would like to do. And while you're doing questions or no questions, I do need to set up another uh, I need to set up my iPhone so that we can go downstairs and, and do that. So once, twice, questions, three times, sold. Okay, let me hey, get Brian. set up. I'm sorry? Hey, Brian, it's Todd. Hey, Todd. Real, real quick question, just out of curiosity. Were those cattle pens to provide beef for the hotel or were they, did they have some other local uh, use in, in terms of the customer base? Uh, uh, you know, that's, I, this is a guess. Uh, since there were cattle pens all along the railroad, I think this was to serve uh, farmers. Uh, but I would, my guess is both the homestead and the, uh, and the Greenbrier 
those were self-sufficient, largely self-sufficient operations. When I was a kid in the late 1960s, going up to the homestead with my parents, I mean, you passed their dairy. They, they had their own cows. And that was just one example of, of local sourcing, which I guess is today's way of putting it. Uh, so bringing cattle in, I, I don't think that would have been the case, but why not? I mean, that certainly is a possibility. Cool, thanks. Sure, sure. Okay, well, if you will give me a moment, uh, everybody can stand up and take a, um, a break. Give me about uh, four or five minutes to make sure that Ernie and I are in communication with each other and we'll continue from the basement. Hey, uh, Brian. Yeah. Before, wait, just one quick question. Yeah. Was there ever a beautifully painted Greenbrier special that BLI, BLI has convinced us to buy? Uh, no, that was uh, when um, Ross Rowland was trying to get that president's special going. Uh, his, uh, his method of selling that to the uh, president, of the, the owner of the hotel. Uh, what's his name? He's the president, he's the uh, governor of West Virginia. Um, in any event, the idea was to uh, paint it green with the, with the gold trim in Greenbrier colors. And uh, it named the engine for him, you know, but on the CNO, uh, it was never more than a black engine. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you bought it, it's it's a collector's item undoubtedly, but it hasn't run yet. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so you'll unfortunately you'll have to use the little screen because I don't know how to make it a bit bigger. All right, so we got audio, we got video, and we can continue. Is that right, Ernie? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. Well, let's let's do this. Let's let's go into the train room. I'll do a demonstration of uh, passenger operations, if you will. And uh, after we do that, I'll try to make that pretty quick. I'll take uh, everybody on a quick tour of the layout, if that's something that you all are interested in. And then we'll have time for questions. So let's move in here. All right, so uh, to look at the layout, White Sulphur Springs, of course, is over here. There's the station. The house track comes in off of the main line down here, goes behind the building, and continues on over to the pocket track. Pocket track then rejoins the main line over here. Freight yards down here. Tail track is down there at the far end. Here's where the cold tipple's gonna be. This is a much more sophisticated boiler house than what was really there. Park tracks are over here. Again, you could find any number of railroads being represented with cars parked there. If there was a president's track, it would be over here. Hotel entrance is more or less right here. And if you look back behind the trees, that's a photograph I got off of uh, Google, Google Maps of the, of the hotel. And that's what I, I hope to uh, fool everybody into thinking that there's a building there. The train that we're going to bring in is to our left. And who knows what, this is probably the sportsman, not probably, I'm going to declare it the sportsman because this is my railroad. I'm not supposed to know what I'm talking about here. So here comes the uh, sportsman's coming in from the west. The cars that are going to stay here are going to be the Santa Fe and New York Central cars that are on the end of the train.
engines are now coming onto the pocket track. So we're going to stop right here over one of those KD electromagnets. And let's see what we can do to make this thing work. I'm going to nudge it back just a little bit. Now we're going to go forward. Ah, it worked. Not just in practice, but it actually worked for the demonstration. Now the car right here is getting hidden, I'm sure, behind the station right now. This last car, Blue Ridge Club, also Chessie 29. Chessie 29 was the car that President Eisenhower traveled in to go down to the Greenbrier, ostensibly to meet with the leaders of Canada and Mexico. But actually what he was going down there for was to talk to them about, about putting in a bomb shelter for, for Congress. The car was designed so that they could have a diaphragm on the end, but yet it had an observation-like quality to it. That way it could run mid-train as well as on the end of the train. And if you had cars on the end of the train for the rest of the daylight run of, of the sportsmen, there you would have kind of an observation setup there. So I'm gonna move this train out of the way over to uh, Allegheny. And we'll start uh, Ali, the uh, FFV, which has come down from New York, on over to uh, White Sulphur Springs. Not real good uh, warning there. We'll do the same routine here. We'll pull past the, right here in front of the camera, in front of these uh, two yellow ties, place the two cars, use the electric magnet to uncouple them while the train pulls through the pocket track and then stops long enough to uncouple the car. It's not a switching move. All we're doing is leaving the car here. All right, let's see what happens here. Probably a bit more of a station stop than that.
not just pulling ahead and getting out of town. We'll stop the train right here at the, at the depot. Then if we come over to Allegheny, we put this throttle down. I said that they would be turning cars at, and engines all the time at Allegheny. So without going through the whole routine of running the engine from White Sulphur over here to Allegheny, uh, here is an H8-1633 uh, all set to uh, put the uh, business car 25 onto the turntable. I've got a permanent magnet, one of those KD permanent magnets sitting there underneath of the, uh, the track just off of the turntable. And hopefully the delaying action works. It did work. And then we would turn the car. The engine would hold up right there. Go back and pick up the car and take it back to uh, White Sulphur Springs. So that's how that operation worked. Uh, why don't we take a, a real quick tour? You, you don't need to see the car go back to uh, back to White Sulphur. When you come over to operate, we'll do that then. The, the bottom line for all this is there's all sorts of operational possibilities in here. We could clear out all of these cars on the park tracks. You've got the cars that are on the pocket and house tracks. All of these cars needed to have something done with them. They were not just going to be here permanently. So uh, all sorts of scenarios can be built into an operating session. And, and I'm just now beginning to wrap my brain around this beyond just the simple leave a car on the pocket track, leave a car on the house track, take a car over here and turn it on the turntable. But there's a lot more possibilities that I'll be able to come up with. And it's largely because of those letters that I was talking about, those 10 years worth of documentation we have that really just provide the script for uh, what can be done here on the layout. So uh, Ernie, if there are any questions about this up to this point, let's, let's pause a moment. And then I thought I would take a, give a quick tour of the layout uh, answer any other questions that might come out of that, and then um, try not to keep everybody too much longer. Well, there's nothing in the chat, question-wise. Uh, if anybody has a question, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask uh, Brian. This is his time. Uh, Brian, with those cars that you're leaving on the on the uh, tracks in front of the you know, station photo, was there local switching that took place of those, or did they just wait until you know a return trip? Did a return trip for the uh, for the train to go back? It, it all of the above. Uh, it, it just depended on what what needed to be done. I, I'm still trying to figure out with the distance of time and space. It's it's difficult to know exactly the precise answer of what happened, but the general way things happen is that the cars, let's say we're just talking about those two cars that you mentioned. At some point, those cars would have gone to Clifton Forge in all probability to be serviced. They had a laundry there and it was the only laundry on the system as it turned out. So there's an example of, of one of the facilities that was available for them to maintain the cars. So they, they, might go to, they might go back to Hinton or even as far out as to Huntington to, to be uh, serviced or uh, whatever it was that the railroad was going to do with it. So it really, it, uh, I think the answer is whatever you can come up with as what you would like to do with these cars based on the knowledge that they got to be serviced, that they're going to be going in another direction. Uh, there's just lots and lots of possibilities. In, in another six months to a year, ask me that question. By that time, I will have gotten through a bunch of those letters and maybe have a little bit better uh, answer for you than, than that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure, that's a good question. Brian, Lee Stormer's asking, how many trains a day uh, pass through the year get there? At this uh, point, you had the two locals, so that's one in each direction. 
you had the, the George Washington Sportsman and FFV, one in each direction. So that's another uh, six. Uh, beyond that, there were some scheduled freights and then there were a ton of extras, mostly uh, coal being moved east to Clifton Forge and ultimately down to Newport News. And then of course, the return of those cars, uh, local freight. So um, there, was, there was a lot of traffic that was going on the Allegheny subdivision. And then the specials, how, you know, the specials, as I said, you know, when they brought that General Motors special in, that was six or seven trains that came in. So it just wasn't one train for that General Motors special, it was several individual trains. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it was individual trains. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I guess I didn't make that very clear. Yeah, it was. I just, I can't imagine the, the photographs of that special that Tom took. It's just a, a huge traffic jam there. It's, it's amazing. But they figured it out. You know, they knew what to do back then. Well, I think we got that question. That's, any other questions? All right, let's, let's do a quick tour. What do you say? Okay. All right, let's go, let's, let's come out of this room. Let's go to the east end of the railroad. This would be Clifton Forge. If I was modeling Clifton Forge. Uh, fortunately, when I was, uh, Bob Rodriguez and I were talking about, we had numerous conversations of what we might do with the staging yard here and uh, how it would not be a staging yard, but it would be a yard like perhaps Covington would be a cool yard to build. But then where would the staging go? And there's as, as generous a space as this is, it's not enough to do that plus have staging in a practical way that we could figure out. So this is staging and it represents Clifton Forge, everything to the east of White Sulphur Springs. It comes down to a stub end here and uh, what I've done is I've had my tracks, my staging tracks come down and terminate at the turntable. It's not motorized, it's just one that's turned by hand. And I can turn all my engines and, and there's lots of tracks in the staging yard and I have room for more if necessary. So that uh, having trains come in and out of here is uh, really easy. To, uh, on this end of the railroad. A little bit more of a challenge on the other end of the railroad. So this is staging, let's move on, on back. Goes through a utility space. The cat has figured out that it can get through the utility space. I've been working on uh, the last operating session I had, uh, it was better we, so to control the switches on the railroad. I was able to use JMRI and I had just a list of the switches uh, and we had a diagram. So you saw the diagram, saw the number of switches and threw it. Since then, I've been able to get this far with building a CTC panel with JMRI. So example of uh, switch number 33 right here is the first switch that is in one, Rochelle, why don't you just show switch uh, 33. So I, I throw the uh, 33 switch, push the, the button, the code button, uh, come back Rochelle one time and we'll do that so that you can see what it looks like on the panel. So I'll just put the switch back to normal. So I click on it. And uh, I haven't done signals yet. That's what the second row is. And it throws it back. So I, I don't know that um, this is, well, the, the next time I think this will work pretty well and be pretty effective. So when we come out of the utility space, we come through Kelly's tunnel. There's really a Kelly's tunnel. There's a picture of it up here. probably done in the 1960s. By then the uh, signal bridges have been painted from black to silver. 
Jerry's run was a huge fill on the rear road. Uh, that's, that's a story unto itself, how that fill was created using wheelbarrows and men. There was uh, no station in 1950, but uh, I, I, I probably am going to keep a station there. Go through Lewis Tunnel, which is a big obstacle for the railroad prior to the Civil War and then immediately after Civil War. This, this was a, a, a tough nut to crack uh, for the railroad to build these. Uh, it was a single tunnel, the gauntlet track, up into the 1930s. And then we come across the mountain, across Lewis Mountain, and you come to East Allegheny. East Allegheny is laid out as far as the switch arrangements. Schematically, this is, this is pretty much how East Allegheny looked. And then you come around the curve here. Four tracks. There was uh, two passing, one each direction. And then the center tracks, the two there, those are the main line. The interlocking was set up in such a way that you could get from any track to any track. And so when you had a, uh, a cold train like uh, this one that's here in front of us, sitting on the, uh, on the siding while they were watering the engine down at East Allegheny, and then ultimately running around on the rear to put the caboose on the end of the train and then send the helper engine over to the turntable and back to Allegheny, you had a lot of flexibility that was built into this arrangement. The A cabin operator controlled the railroad from just to the west of Allegheny Tunnel, which is at the end down here at a place called Tuckahoe on just the other side of the mountain, all the way back to where we came into the room at Kelly's, uh, Kelly's Tunnel. And the track arrangement here is pretty much minus one of the crossover, which I've compensated for uh, elsewhere, uh, is pretty much what you would have found at Allegheny. One siding, there was a cattle pen there. By the 1950s, I, I think the chances of it being uh, very much in operation, pretty small. Allegheny was also the jumping off point for some of these other mineral springs. And you would get to some of those others by stage back in the 1890s. Down here at the end, this would be Tuckahoe, which is between Allegheny and White Sulphur Springs. We've already looked at the, the, the arrangement over here with the tracks. Uh, this is the freight station area. It goes down just like it did at White Sulphur Springs. We continue past White Sulphur Springs, the hotel. This view block here, uh, this is going to be the Greenbrier River. Behind the Greenbrier River is the, the staging yard for Durban and uh, points up the, uh, the Greenbrier branch. This would be Whitcomb Junction, which was just a couple miles from Ronsford, where the Greenbrier branch met the main line on the CNO. And then Ronsford, uh, it's, it's conceptually the same, but there was just no way I could arrange it uh, the way Ronsford was actually set up. I have an engine house that's much nicer than what they had at Ronsford. Turntables located relative to the way Ronsford was laid out in the correct area. Uh, uh, this is, these are LED uh, lamps, uh, lamps, uh, fluorescent type lights, but they're LEDs. Uh, they can be uh, linked together in groups of four. And they were pretty much in our eyes uh, until Rochelle made, uh, made this block so that the lights don't get in your eyes between one side of the layout to the other. And I, I thought, yeah, I've also got these kind of spotlight type things, utility type lights. And then back to Ronsford. Um, this is a building that's really still there. It's a huge hardware store. I don't know if it's still a hardware store, but back then, just amazing how big this building is. Uh, I wanted something 
here rather than just green backdrop. These are all off Google Maps. These are all buildings that are in Rossford. So that's giving me some ideas of how I might be able to uh, uh, create something here. I, I don't know what I'll do exactly just yet. The station is not correct at all, but uh, can't have everything. So that's Rossford. The freight station is an example of what I've been doing on the silhouette. Uh, this uh, minimum turning radius is uh, over here at Allegheny is probably 32 inches. I'm not real sure over here at Rossford. Uh, it's greater than 32. Uh, in the yard, of course, it's a lot, lot tighter radius than that. The, uh, the curve turnouts are all the largest ones that I could buy from Shinohara. Uh, building here, this is a, a mock-up uh, using my silhouette. The best part of the mock-up was being able to replicate this verge board. I now have hope I'm going to be able to do that. And the, the building is uh, it's a styrofoam block. And then I just glued the a printout of... Uh, of the architectural plan that I had. So that's better than having nothing here, I can tell you that. Well, I think it's better than nothing. Um, we go through Second Creek Tunnel over here, and then the railroad goes up the grade into Snowflake. The Snowflake quarry was called Snowflake simply because of the color of the gravel that came out of here. CNO got a lot of their ballast out of Snowflake. Again, this was another, I was talking about one of Matt's suggestions. This was all just a flat railroad. There was nothing up here. And he was talking about, you know, operationally, could something be put in here? And uh, building up was, was the solution rather than just staying level. Uh, the, the curve underneath didn't really give us a lot of flexibility underneath here. Um, and then we go around under the stairs into the shop. And the shop was just, it was just a, a stub end staging yard. It was a big parking lot. It was terribly unsatisfactory. Sorry. That's okay. Or if sometimes you hold that button, that, that'll take care of that. Yeah, the top button. You no, know, maybe it's not working. Sorry, everybody, for the. Close your eyes. I don't know why it's not. Maybe the. Uh, maybe the battery power has gone down. Stand by while we uh, correct for this. Camera person. Okay. So uh, again, Matt's suggestion was, is there something operationally that could be done in here rather than just staging? And again, that was a masterful suggestion. Uh, took a little bit of thinking to come up with this, but this is Hinton, kind of laid out as Hinton is, the, the freight station, which is right here, uh, sat down a hill, and then there was a grocery supplier here. So that's... Um, it's kind of these pictures up here, actually. Uh, this picture shows the uh, freight house. The freight house, and then back here is where the uh, distributor is, was located. Uh, the, the station is truncated from what all is there. Again, the styrofoam blocks and uh, print out the architectural rendering I had of it to give some sense of how this thing is going to go together. Uh, turntable, I've got a lot of engines uh, so that we can do those changes from water level to mountain engines. That was, uh, we did that for the first time the last session, rather than me trying to have all sorts of local switching and just, uh, it seemed like that just changing engines uh, occupied the, the Hinton crew of two uh, pretty gainfully. 
And then it swings around, and then this is staging over here on the uh, other side of, of the wall. Kind of a this is kind of a tight setup in terms of curves. These are the largest. I, the reason I'm saying largest curve turnout. I should have hired. I can't remember what number they call them right now. Uh, but this this is very very tight, especially when you send those HH through here. This track right here has got to be less than 32 inches. Really wasn't able to calculate that. Uh, goes through staging here. I only have five tracks available for staging over here. Uh, it seemed to work out. And then the, the last part of the tour is back here. This is the end of staging here. And, and I've set this up so that once again, we can bring the engines down here, back them up, and then to be able to put them on the turntable. That's more of a function of me between sessions. I, at this point, I don't see this happening, needing to happen during a session. But the point is, is that engines don't get trapped in here, which was originally the situation before I cut through the wall and had some area to work with down here. And that's the tour of the layout. Be glad to answer any questions. Brian, going back to the trains coming in to Hot Springs and such, uh, we were talking about there's numerous trains, numerous trains a day. But what kind of a time frame would it be like from the first train to the last train? I would say, are you talking just passenger? Uh, the question was what time frame involved with like this is the vm special with the six trains coming in and it says what train what time frame arrived uh, uh well you know what we should i should do is uh maybe i should go back up to the computer because i've got that schedule and, and we can see that okay okay so i'll, I'll do that i'm going to give me just a moment uh we can sign I, well let's keep this going just in case Okay. You can still hear me, Ernie? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me turn down the volume on my computer. Okay, that's better. All right, so let's uh, let me share this screen instead. Am I sharing my screen there, Ernie? Uh, got, yeah, yes. There, there you go. go. Okay. Let's see where did I put the schedule? Here we go. So this would have been the schedule. For the three trains, each direction. Uh, and then on the outside here, edge, those are the two locals. So you had a train arrive at 5.55 AM, 12.15 AM, 6 PM, 7.25 AM. 1.40 a.m., 9 p.m., then the two locals, 8.30 p.m., and 7 a.m. And then the, the specials would, would travel, as a, sometimes they would travel as a second section of one of these trains. Sometimes they would be on their own schedule. So I don't know if I'm answering the question or not. I'll throw that back to Lee Stormer. He was the one that asked the question. So I'll see if that. Did it... No, I didn't. All right, let me, let me see if I can find the. Uh... What was the question again? And he says, yes, that answered it. Okay. Um, something about the GM special. Uh, oh, someone was asking about the GM special. What was, what was the question regarding that? Uh, 
I was in the chat. Lee was asking if uh, you were going to try modeling the GM special or um, some such event. Oh, well, there are other events that are uh, on that scale that I do have documentation for. I, I don't have as much, much documentation about the GM special. Tom Dixon wrote a story about that years ago for the CNO Society newsletter. I suspect that he has some, some notes that he took at the time. Uh, but if, if I were to try to do a big special like that, uh, first of all, I don't have enough passenger cars. Uh, but, but I do have the, the scenario. So I'm trying to remember the, the one company, I think it was W.T. Grant, had uh, specials into the, uh, into the uh, Greenbrier that were just on the order of the GM special. Yeah, I'm not seeing any other questions come up. Uh, okay, fabulous. Yeah, that, that answered it, Brian. I was wondering if, if you're gonna to try to model one of the specials like that, because I'm, I'm familiar with the Santa Fe specials that they would run for the scouts going up to the Grand Canyon. And I've mm. seen picture before where it was, it was a small yard up there, but they had huge amounts of trains and they're packed in and out. And there was a presentation I saw where one of the guys was talking about the shuffling of getting trains in and back out again. And you reminded me of it when you were saying about the, the GM special having six tra trains. I was just wondering about the time frame of like, did they all try and arrive at once or were they like stacked in that they got one in and got the next one out? So, yeah, I, I they, they were sequential that, that much I'm pretty confident about. Uh, but again, how they were able to, to create a ballet that would allow all of that equipment to come in in such a way as not to, to gum up the next part. That's, that, that had to be an interesting thing to, that would be an interesting conversation to have with somebody who was actually there. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's anybody who was actually there. It's hard to believe that 70, 1972 is 50 years ago. Okay, I'm taken by the silence there, Ernie, that uh, we've pretty much covered. It. No, I didn't. Oh, thank you, Todd. Appreciate that. Uh, and Todd, I, I really did. Uh, I really did read your article. I went back and found that, and uh, uh, that was that was really uh, really helpful information. The, the, the one thing I'll have to talk to you about. It seems like the gimbal failed on us here at the end. That's that's why everybody got dumped overboard. Well, you, you'll recall that it failed on me too when I hit the wrong button on it as well when I was trying to do this. So, uh, uh, no, that's right. But I. I, see, in this case, I had it planned out really well. I wasn't holding the gimbal at all. So it was all my <laughs> wife's fault. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, yeah, whether it was a, a charge issue or, you know, just hit the wrong button, I found that sometimes it can be a little sensitive. But uh, overall, it seemed to work well. I'm glad you guys gave it a shot. Kudos yeah, well, all would, around. Uh, thank you so much. Control software you were using. Uh, let's see, what is it? Oh, control software, uh, the uh, uh, Digitrax. And then the JMRI is what I've been using for, um, I do I use JMRI for two things. One is a, a programming sound on the engines. The engine sounds are important to me, trying to get the volume, not just at a, as a good level, that, 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 that's a real debatable issue because not all of us like to have sound uh, and some of us would like to have more sound than others. I, I, uh, but as a musician, I'm thinking about, uh, do I have the flutes and the trumpets and the drums in the proper balance? And you have the same consideration when you have a whistle, uh, a, 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 a dynamo for uh, providing electricity and the chuffs uh, of, of the uh, engine. It's all the different components that are in the engine. Uh, those, uh, the, the JMIR software is about the only way without pulling your hair out uh, that I can see that you can program that stuff 
Um, otherwise, you're having to deal with individual CVs one at a time. So I do that. The, uh, the switches are all controlled. I can control those out of my throttle. Uh, then I've got the, uh, that uh, CTC board, or what appears to be a CTC board. Uh, I seem to be uh, getting on with learning how to do that. The, the next thing is to try to figure out some signaling. Uh, that, that I'm sure is going to take quite a while to do that. So those are the two things that I'm using. The, the JMRI, I'll add to that. Boy, is that a two-edged sword? On the one hand, it's just wonderful what you can do with that. And on the other hand, trying to figure out how to make it work at times is just simply not easy. I, I finally stumbled on a tutorial of how to do the, uh, the what I've done so far. But up to that point, I simply could not figure it out. All right, Bernie, this has been good.